I have been a financial planner for over 12 years, and I have helped hundreds of people retire from all walks of life. Some had only a few hundred thousand dollars, and others had several million. But they all had the same goal in mind, a worry-free retirement. Whether you are preparing for retirement, recently hung up your professional hat, or just trying to make the most of it, this video is for you. I'm gonna summarize my 12 biggest takeaways from my 12 years working as a financial planner, which you can implement yourself today. This process will help you cut through the noise and focus on what moves the needle the most. It's your favorite Scotsman here again, and let's get stuck right in with the first thing you need to know. Start early. Not exactly earth shattering news, but it does bear repeating. A few decades ago, retirement planning was simpler and more predictable. Defined benefit pension plans were more common, offering a guaranteed income for life. Fast forward to today, and those pensions are rare. They've been replaced by defined contribution plans or group RRSPs, where the responsibility of funding and managing retirement income has shifted to you. How can you mitigate this risk? Simply put, start as early as possible. This chart speaks for itself, but it's not exactly helpful if you're already 50 years old and wondering how you can catch up. All is not lost though. Discipline, aggressive savings, and a willingness to be flexible on your goals will put in a lot of the legwork to get you back up to speed. It could be as simple as delaying retirement, getting a part-time job to supplement your retirement income, or cashing in in the equity you've built up in your home. Speaking of goals, the second takeaway I have for you is to be very specific in your goals and chart a pathway to reach them. Think about it like this. You work all week. The weekend rolls around. You've got a list of items you need to do in the house. If you're like me, you jot down your tasks because without a list to refer back to, you'd likely overlook one or two. Why would you treat your retirement and life goals any differently? People will literally plan more for a two week vacation than they will for a 30 year retirement. Sit down and clearly articulate what you want to do with your life. Determine who you want to spend your time with, what you want to do, and what brings you purpose and fulfillment, and then begin to map out your path to success. This may be stating the obvious to some of you, but in countless occasions, I've been sitting down with two spouses who have very different goals, and this is okay, but you need to be on the same page in terms of priority. So make sure that you and your spouse are aligned and know what each other wants. If you need to enlist the help of a financial planner to piece it all together, then feel free to reach out to our office and we'll point you in the right direction. On the subject of financial planning, let's move on to number three today. And it's a biggie. Don't have too much in your RRSP. When saving for retirement, Canadians often automatically default to contributing to the RRSP. But this can occasionally be detrimental particularly if you anticipate earning a high income in retirement. You've probably heard of OAS clawback. Yeah, that's the one where you have to give back a portion of your OAS each year if you earn too much. For more detail, you may want to check out another video of mine on five ways to avoid OAS clawback, which you can find a link for in the show notes. For today though, we'll be keeping it short and simple. If you have an income of $90,997 or more, you will start to lose a portion of your OAS benefits. Once your income exceeds a total of $148,065 for age 65 to 74, and just over $153,000 for ages 75 and over, you lose it all. It may sound dramatic, and that's because it is. Your OAS could be wiped clean. Now, who could be impacted by this? The most common cases we see are individuals who have large pensions coupled with a large RRSP. If you find yourself in this category, you might want to consider diverting those RRSP funds to a TFSA or a non-registered account instead. Talking about pensions, let's move on to my fourth takeaway for today. Do not underestimate the CPP. Very short break here. If you aren't one of the 1500 that has downloaded our free retirement planning guide, click on the link in the pinned comment in the comment section below and get your copy today. To quote one reader, goes by the name of Bob, this is the best retirement guide I have read on the internet, so don't miss out. CPP isn't enough to live on. That CPP won't do much for me in retirement. It's not gonna pay the bills, is it? I can't tell you the number of times I have heard people say this. The truth of the matter is that they're both right and wrong. 
CPP was never designed to be enough to cover your retirement income needs. But for most people, it's a very significant contributor. If you've listened to me before, you will know I generally don't recommend taking CPP early unless you're in poor health or strapped for cash. For today though, let's take Jason and Laura as our hypothetical example. Both spouses anticipate getting close to the maximum CPP when they elect to take it at age 65. That's a little over $32,000 annually combined, indexed to inflation and guaranteed for life. Now, for an apples to apples comparison, if you were to go into the market today and buy an annuity that would pay you 32,000 a year index for life, you would have to fork over a total of just over 560 grand if you're a male and over 600 grand if you're a female. I would hope that you don't need a financial advisor to tell you that that's a fair chunk of cash. So underestimate the CPP at your peril. My next takeaway is something else you should not underestimate. And that's the danger of retiring with debt. In our office, we tend to see that most clients come up with a lower retirement income than what they earned during their working lives. Typically though, some expenses also retire with you. You pay off the mortgage and you don't need to save for retirement, which often results in comparable income before and after retirement. If you're sitting in a fat mortgage or line of credit though, it will not happen as quickly, if at all. The interest rates going up the past couple of years, debt payments have increased dramatically, eating into retirement incomes across the country. I remember working with a client who was nearing retirement, but still had a hefty mortgage. We worked out a plan to accelerate his payments and he managed to pay off his mortgage just a year before retiring. This gave him tremendous peace of mind. My tip, as much as you possibly can, eliminate debt by the time you retire. And if you can't, my sixth takeaway for today is something you must embrace, flexibility. Being able to adapt and reduce some of those nice to haves but not essentials for daily living is necessary. And even if you don't have debt, you must be flexible in retirement. Looking back over the last 25 years, we've seen the aftermath of the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s and the lead up to the 2008 financial crisis. These events caused significant market fluctuations, severely impacting retirement savings. In recent years, we've seen plenty of ups and downs in the markets. If there's one thing I can guarantee, markets will go down again at some point in the future. It is essential to have a long-term perspective and avoid making hasty decisions based on short-term market movements. But you should have a plan in place for a situation like this. One option is to keep funds in cash and use them while you wait for your investments to recover. Another option is to reduce or even halt withdrawals from your portfolio till you start to see a turnaround, which leads us to our next point. Adopt or adapt a retirement withdrawal strategy. Mistakes in managing how you make withdrawals from your investment accounts can drastically reduce your savings lifespan, increase your taxes, and cause you a lot of stress and anxiety. How do you plan to pay for one-off larger expenses? When should you start to draw down on your RSP? Are you making the most of those precious early retirement years? A withdrawal strategy should cover all of this. At a minimum though, make sure you have funds in a TFSA to pay for the one-off larger expenses. And if you happen to retire early, make sure you take advantage of any lower income earning years before CPP and OAS kick in to draw down on your RRSP. For number eight, I wanna put aside withdrawal strategies, market fluctuations, CPP and debt. Retirement is not all about money. Yes, the money is important, but the emotional transition is as much, if not more, important. I'm not referring to the initial days, weeks, or even months, commonly known as the honeymoon period. It's what happens afterwards. Leaving your job or career behind can lead to a significant amount of friction in your day-to-day -day life. It can include a loss of identity, a loss of community, and sometimes even a loss of title and benefits. This transition from a 30 to 40 year phase of your life where you become accustomed to having a position of authority to suddenly not having one can be quite challenging. It's something many of our clients have struggled with. Linda was one of those. She felt a loss of identity after leaving her long time job. We discussed her passions and interests and she decided to volunteer at a local food shelter. This gave her a new sense of purpose and community, making her retirement years much more fulfilling. This transition is something I want you to take seriously. Craft a clear, non-financial vision for your retirement. Create a fulfilling routine filled with all the hobbies and activities you may have wanted to do, 
but not had the time for. And make sure you and your spouse are aligned with how your retirement will look. You don't have to do everything together, but you need to communicate and be on the same page. Talking about communication, in today's world, you need to be skeptical and cautious of anything that sounds too good to be true. If something's too good to be true, it probably is. Run as far as you can from any financial advisor that guarantees returns. On top of that, cyber security threats and fraud have become more prevalent, requiring vigilance to protect your information. Use secure platforms and practices to safeguard your retirement savings. Use strong passwords. Yes, I'm looking at you, password one, two, three. Monitor your accounts for suspicious activity. Check your credit score regularly and try to stay informed as possible. You may also want to check out a video I did on the latest scams and how to protect yourself. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Moving on to number 10, it's morbid and we generally don't like to talk about it. That is probably why over 50% of Canadians do not have a will. If you are one of them, then I would ask you one simple question. Do you want the government to decide how your estate is settled? Or if you become incapacitated, do you want them to decide who manages your affairs? Do you think your family wants to deal with that while going through an already stressful and painful experience? No, I thought not. Get your legal documents in order. For most, it's really not that painful and it's quite straightforward. At a minimum, you should have a will and two powers of attorney. One to manage your property and finances if you can't and one to make your health decision. Once you get that covered, talk to your family and kids. Let them know what is going to happen and what your wishes are. Document where everything is. We have a valuable tool known as the estate directory that is ideal for recording account numbers, phone numbers, and any other crucial information your family may require after your death. If you want a copy, leave a comment in the comment section and I'd be happy to send you one. Now that we have all that morbidity out of the way, let's move on to something more positive, planning for the worst. We always hope for the best, but when it comes to your retirement, you should absolutely plan for the worst. What happens if one spouse passes away early? What if we see another 2008 market scenario? What if you need to make extensive repairs to your house? You should plan for all of these things to ensure your retirement is worry-free or at least less stressful than it would be without a plan. If you have a primary decision maker in the family when it comes to finances, that's fine. A lot of couples do this, but this is one area where both spouses' concerns should be held and concerns alleviated. And when it comes to concerns, I'm gonna leave you today with my biggest takeaway in my 12 years as a retirement planner. Very often in this business, simple things are made more complex and confusing. I'm not saying there isn't complexity, but ultimately, when it comes down to it, what most people want to know is very simple. Am I going to be okay? That's it, a simple, straightforward question. So, if you're working with a financial planner who can answer that question for you, and can't demonstrate how you're going to be okay or what you need to do to be okay, then you should probably think about seeing what other options are out there for you. You should feel confident that you're going to be okay. And if you aren't going to be okay, then you should know why and what steps you need to take to be okay. You've probably heard enough of this Scotsman for today, so get out there and implement what we've talked about. The time is now. Don't forget to head over to the pinned comment in the comments section and get your free retirement guide and have you ever wondered what you need to do to retire at any age? This next video is for you.